What's up, Jay Silverman? Good morning. Just like that, boom, we're, we're on. You like that? I can't compare it. You were on the runway 15 minutes ago, and now you're on the Action Junkies podcast. How about that? Unbelievable. <laughs> and, and an hour and a half ago, I was waiting in line for a Slurpee in LAX. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. That's funny. Uh, so you sent me this link a few weeks ago to your movie. This is your first movie, right? No, it's my fourth. Fourth, okay. Yeah. Your fourth movie, and you go, here's a link. It's got a lot of sex <laughs> and a lot of foul language, and I was all excited, <laughs> and uh, it didn't have any of that. <laughs> but it was great. Thank you. I was, you know, I... Uh, to give a little context to everyone, I've, I first met you probably, oh man, I don't know, I want to say 15, 16 years ago, probably like 04 maybe, uh, with our friend Todd McGowan. You That's were shooting, uh, I think, the Black Velvet <laughs> campaign, right? Yeah. That's with correct. With maybe Carol Grow or Rachel Moore or Joanna Krupa, all those girls. You shot all those we girls. We did them all. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so in my head... I, I, you are in my head. Here's how I see you. Okay, you're a a very well known photographer in L.A. and you shoot a lot of hot, sexy stuff, alcohol brands, right? Your Hollywood, your office, your studio is in literally the heart of Hollywood. Like it's crazy to me that you, are you still in that same place yeah. that I saw? Mm, we're we're in a place okay. right by the CNN building now. R okay, yeah. So I mean, but you've been in in like Hollywood, like that. That's not cheap. So you're doing something right, Jay Silver. And you're you're Thank you. the place I was at was massive. Yeah, that's my new place. Okay, yeah. and you were actually I knew that this wasn't your first movie because when, when I was there, you were shooting a movie. You were actually shooting a movie. I, I mean, I'd been there when you shot uh, for Black Velvet, but right. I think the last time I was over there, I just came, I came by just to uh, grab lunch with Todd, and you were in the middle of shooting. I want to say that was your first movie, but don't quote me. No. But in my head, you do this really like you do sexy stuff, right? So when you sent me the link to this movie, and it's called Saving Paradise, it's kind of, to me, like, just off the title, I'm like, oh, saving, because then I read, you know, nudity and language, saving paradise. I'm like, this is about a couple stranded on an island or something. Uh, you know, my head was doing all kinds of math. Um, not the case. Not the case. <laughs> but I was pleasantly surprised. I was shocked um, on the subject matter, because how did this come about? Well... Do you want to, can you tell the people, do you want to give yeah, them a, a little sure, brief synopsis sure. of what the movie is? Saving Paradise is a, I, I, I taught it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful movie during these challenging times of what's going on in the United States and not even with the pandemic, but you know, this incredible political environment we're in right now. And this movie is not political, it's about the common man who in middle America has a great job and one day the factory uh, is essentially in play to be taken over by a foreign entity or gone out of business and it's about the workers kind of like it's a wonderful life and mm -hmm. the movie Norma Ray where the the town independently fights to save uh, uh, a pencil factory yeah yeah I was so shocked like when I was watching I was like wait this is, how is he going to work nudity into this? It was so funny. Like, I'm sitting there watching, and then I finally realized, like, oh, I looked back at your email, and I was like, oh, there's a little smiley face. He's kidding. <laughs> you, you know what's funny is I made a movie uh, two years, three years ago called Off the Menu, and uh, it just, it's playing for free right now on Prime uh, on Amazon, and, and I looked at the, the rating, and it said uh, sex, drugs, and you know all the superlatives yeah. in yeah. that regard and i literally had to sit there and think you mean when he walked in the room and ran into her and then the lights went out that's sex there was no sex in my movie there was just the, right, right. the suggestion right. that sex took place so in my new movie you know there is suggestion <laughs> <laughs> you got to use your imagination yeah. yeah that's funny um when did you decide you wanted to start making films because you were doing still photography for right forever right was that always the plan was to parlay that well, or 
about 25 years ago, I started doing just commercials, mm -hmm. and I was doing what I described as hybrid mm -hmm. filmmaking, which means I would shoot the stills as well as the television commercial. And m most of the people I worked with were celebrities because, you know, ultimately they were doing endorsements, and that was my thing, working with people from all walks of life, whether it be Michael Jordan, Ray Charles, or or people that were in the headlines, rappers or what have yeah. you. Snoop Dogg, right? Exactly. And uh, anyways, the conclusion of it is that segued into making television commercials, and then subsequently I wanted to make movies. And my first movie, which is called Girl on the Edge, was about my daughter who uh, at a very young age of 15 was getting you know, brutally uh, challenged in, in, in high school. Um, like bullied? Bullied and also, uh, unfortunately, the way uh, in her situation, you know, it was uh, the, the, the ninth graders, or I guess the, the ones that are getting ready to graduate high school, yep. were preying on the, the newcomers, and uh, it's no joke. I mean, it's a yeah. real, real difficult deal. So yeah. as we wake up in the morning and start to, you know, become mature adults, we start to realize these challenges of raising children in this, this world. And my movie is about equine therapy and how it basically resurrected my daughter, uh, mm. both uh, emotionally and clinically from really devastating depression and, you know, the choice of using drugs or alcohol to kind of uh, survive yeah. that kind of humility, you know. And how is she today? She's doing great. Yeah. She's doing great. I have three daughters, and but not one of them uh, did not deal with this type of problem. Right, right. I can't imagine being a parent, especially today, like with social media and stuff. Oh my God, no thanks. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. Yeah, my youngest daughter, and I'm telling, I will never mention names here, but she was going to uh, a junior high, and a very famous celebrity. Uh, son sent her a picture of his privates. You know? Really? And uh, anyways, long story short, now the guy is a big star. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. And, and I, I do remember that very moment where I sat down with the guy and his wife and I said, you know, your son sent this picture of his Oh, you actually of his penis. went to the parents? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a very embarrassing thing for both of us. Right. You know? Right. But uh, and his father was famous, too. No, his father was the famous one. Yeah. Oh, his father was the famous yeah, one. Okay. Yeah. But, and, you know, I mean, it's life. But right. I never had this stuff when I was a kid. Right. <laughs> Maybe I found one in a, in a, in a drugstore. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But, yeah. We used to, I remember when I was little, we would, <laughs> you know, I grew up in Brentwood. Uh, I told you on the way over here, I grew up in OJ's house before OJ lived there. Right. And uh, so I would walk to Kenter Canyon Elementary School. And uh, me and my friend Robert Ashley, who's now a doctor, Doctor Robert Ashley, but by uh, you know when we were in fourth grade, right. uh, we would walk to school and we would, for, I don't know why, we would randomly open mailboxes. <laughs> and <laughs> wait, should I say? Can they press charge? We're past the statute of limitation, right? Okay, yes, yeah, so we would randomly open mailboxes, and um, and we wouldn't steal the mail, but we would look like at what they had, like we were looking specifically for magazines. And we found one that used to get this magazine called We. Do you remember of We? Of course. I worked for We. Shut up. I, did you really? I, I did a photography job for them at the beginning of my career. Big so deal. So for, <laughs> for those uh, that are Q -U -I. under the... QUI. Yeah, yeah. QUI. <laughs> so it was like Penthouse, right? But it was right. raunchy. Like, a little raunchier. Yeah, yeah, like a step up from Penthouse. Travis just got excited over there. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, and... Uh, yeah, I remember we would sit in, in like the bushes, like like of this of, of like of someone's yard, you know, front yard, and we would just look through the pictures. Then we would put the magazine back into the mailbox, like it was just crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> you didn't mention who it was. I didn't know. I don't oh, know. I yeah, yeah. It was just random houses, you know. It was some house on Oakmont. Do you do you know That's, Oakmont Drive? Yeah, yeah. Course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Um, so how uh, the first film you made? What was the budget? And how did you get the money? Well, the budget for that movie was under a million dollars. And the first film was, it stars some pretty big people. It had uh, Peter Coyote. It had um, uh, what, what I consider to be, you know, a, a cast of recognizable people. 
um, uh, Mackenzie Phillips played yeah, sure. one of the characters. Um, and you know, I, I guess the, 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 you asked who financed it and stuff in this particular case, uh, you know, I'm, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I inherited some money and used it all to make that movie. Love it. You know, and, and it was a gift to my uncle who I inherited the money from. So it, to me, the, the biggest joy and this, the biggest sadness was he wasn't there to, uh, right. to see what his money did. But to this day, and I say to you, I made that movie in 2014. I'm telling you, uh, it has saved lives. I'm kind of like invested heavily as a human being in helping people with similar you know, conditions yep. uh, as a parent. And, you know, it's, it's important to me to give back. So yeah. that's a big part of my career. And this movie that I just made, yeah. Saving Paradise, is, is, is a movie that's got meaning, it's got purpose, and it's uplifting, you know. And, you know, yeah. there's not a lot of that around. Yeah. And it, it's not some, don't misinterpret this, but it's not some religious movie you yeah. know, at all. And I was really excited to have you on, A, because, uh, you know, I, I've, I've known you for a long time and I haven't sure. seen you in ages. But, uh, you know, when Todd McGowan was like, hey, what did you think of this? I was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, but the other reason is, you know, myself, you know, I majored in film. I dropped out with a semester to go. Uh, and then life happened and I never really got, you know, to, to make any films or anything. And Travis here, our engineer, our chief nerd here Hi at there. Sticky Paws. Uh, he just graduated film school at UNLV, and we're like, we're on a mission to make a movie, and so like, it's just like, the, to take something from an idea to a finished product, I don't know if people understand how hard that is to do, especially if you don't have Paramount behind you. Right. Um, right. I mean, so, so for saving prior, uh, paradise and we'll talk about the movie and sure. my thoughts on it, which I loved. Um, what was the budget on that? How did you get this made? How did you do it? Jay, tell, teach us how you did this. Ah. Well, number one, um, the movie would have never gotten made if my associate Bethany Serona and an individual named Van Bellet who wrote the movie, uh, came in contact through a, uh, a device that's currently, you know, really active called the the blacklist, and the blacklist is a um, is a link that you can go to if you're a legitimate producer and search for content, and you can read raw scripts that are, are you know, highly celebrated, but were never made, mm. and um, so that's how I did it, you know, versus you want to tell a story about yourself or mm -hmm. what's going on. This is a situation where you know when I made my first movie. Girl on the Edge, that movie was about my life experience. So I really wanted to tell the story. Yep. Uh, by the way, Gil Bellows, if you guys ever watched Felicity, plays me. <laughs> oh, wow. So, and you'll feel that same oddity when, if right. you do make a movie and someone's playing you, yep. you know, yep. or you're playing yourself, it, it does. It's it's the most bizarre thing to sit in a, in a director's chair and them, uh, meaning the actors, play out a moment that is uh, straight out of your own life right that's highly emotional that's right. that's highly uh, uh amped and everybody's crying and you're sitting there going holy shit what have i done you yeah know? yeah however it's very rewarding because in this particular case getting back to the premise of that movie was about you know being uh, a child being challenged with post-traumatic stress and all this I really think as a human being, you know, to be able to tell the story from the parent's point of view uh, is helpful, you yeah. know, especially if you're going through it yourself and you go, I don't know where the fuck to go. You right. know, I don't know. Who, sure. who do you call? You know, I always think Ghostbusters, you right. know what I mean? <laughs> no, but who do you call? I mean, do you, yeah. you know, there, there, it is outside the parameter of calling your dentist, calling your, yeah. your psychiatrist. You know, this is tough stuff. Right. Right, but my new film, uh, you know, I give all the credit to uh, the writer, uh, and his name was Van Bellet. And Van, uh, it's a true story about a uh, investment banker that uh, his story, you know, where he he used to have a very successful uh, investment bank company, and he would go and buy companies and hold on to them. Versus Wall Street's uh, tactic would be to buy a company and and turn it over and get rid of employees and yep. 
move it to another country or state. So uh, he he bought a pen company, and then he wanted to buy a pencil company, and, and he keeps them. And they triple, quadruple, they multiply, and they turn into huge assets. Yeah. They become big employers to the community. And in this particular case, the one that he tried to buy ended up getting bought by a company, and they, they rebuilt the factory in Mexico. So our story's got a little creative license, but in all honesty, it's, it's that story. And it's really, uh, you know, uh, highly yeah. uh, um, passionate and yeah. moving. I can't lie. I had a couple tears. I had a no. couple tears. I swear to you, at the end, I had a couple tears. Yeah. With Walter. Uh, yeah, that, that, that arc. I loved that. You, you, you know, I got to mention this. Just as I'm getting on the plane, I listened to a podcast with Walter, the character. Yeah. And the character Walter is... He was in, great. Yeah. Well, he is an individual that is an actor under the heading of being uh, a individual that has Asperger. Okay. And we, you know, with the, the politically correct nature of everything today, yeah. you know, we did not want to hire an actor to play an Asperger. Got it. We wanted to hire the real thing. And this kid just knocked it out of the park. Yeah. He was great. He was great. His name's George Steves, just that I tell you. Yeah, he was yeah. he was great and that whole thing like that's a fact. And then when he when he gave his uh, opinion yeah. uh later his uh what do you call he it? Did a full turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. So good. Yeah, it was, it was really good. It was a fun movie. Like at first, I was like, "Where is this going?" You know, because in my head, I was prepared for something different. You know, so I was like, "Wait!" I was trying to figure out what's the twist. I was like, all like, you know, screwed up in my head. Um, but uh, yeah, I watched it with Vanessa, and we we loved it last night. You know, thank you. Yeah, thank it was you. really good. But just the the fact that you're able to just get these made like that, just. The lone wolf over there, you know, uh, it's pretty impressive. Well, I'll tell you something. One of the most fulfilling parts to me as a filmmaker is doing, I think, and it was even when we worked together on these Black Velvet things. Yeah. I mean, I, I really genuinely get fulfillment out of turning um, nothing into something. Yep. And in, in that movie, I don't know if you're aware of it, but, uh, you know, all the factory scenes are a real pencil factory, but... The whole movie was filmed in Los Angeles, even though it takes place in right. Pennsylvania. <laughs> right. And that type of stuff is fun, you know, when you start to put it together and no one can tell. You know? In the very beginning, um, where it looks like it's the outside of the factory, isn't that your... Is that really the factory, or is that your office? No, is that it's... Your it's a, okay. The, 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 the factory depicted in the movie... Ex from the exterior is a furniture factory in Los Angeles. A furniture Down factory? In okay. Vernon, California. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But and how many days did it take to shoot that? The whole movie was shot in 19 days. That's unbelievable. I know. I That's know. unbelievable. It's a logistical, uh, you know, puzzle. And, yeah. And the, here again, the fulfillment is, and, and I'm really, really passionate about this. The fulfillment comes in telling a story that um, is depicted through the, the, the actors. You know, the, the lead actor um, uh, is his, <laughs> he was just brilliant, is a British actor. He, he's, really? He's the star of uh, all the Narnia series. Oh, wow. The little boy, he turned into a big boy. <laughs> oh, okay. And uh, yeah, he was great. So his name is William Mosley, and he, he just knocked it out of the park. Yeah, he was great. The chemistry between him. And his like childhood friend, and, yeah, and she was the CFO. <laughs> yeah, Charlie. Uh, yeah, they had great chemistry, and and Thank you. Uh, you know, it, you're like you're hoping like, what, what? Wake up, dude! Like, what are you doing? You know? And then finally, he does. You know? Right. And that's a spoiler alert. But uh, yeah, it was a uh, it was a really fun fun movie. Thank you. You know? Congrats! It was really cool. And so, um, do you go out and find like investors for? To, to bring that to life? In, in this particular case, we had one investor that had a great interest in the movie. And, um, and yeah, that's another exciting component. I mean, I'm, I'm at a stage in my life where I want to give back. And to me, there's nothing more fulfilling than taking an outsider who's never made a movie before down this road of yeah. actually fulfillment, actually, you know, soup the nuts. Yep. And it's no different than you doing what you do every day yeah. here. You know, there's a certain mechanism in which yeah. stimulates you, you know, to yep. get, you get, you get excited. And when you shoot a movie like this in 19 days and you're the director, are you comprom making compromise? Is it, is it a uh, 19 days of compromises? Is that how it goes down? Or like, 
or is it everything? I mean, nothing goes the way you plan, right? Or well, typically filmmakers will tell you the same thing, and that is, you know, independent movies more than anything, you know, require you to be really. You have to have your shit together. I mean, there's right. no way that you can make a movie in 19 days unless you're anticipating all the logistics, all the things that could go wrong, all the things that you want that you can't give up and yep. things that you're willing to give up, you know? Yep. Um, like I said, this is my fourth movie. So the ultimate clue to that is, 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 is it's decision-making has to come immediately. You right. can't, you can't forestall it because it's going to cost you days and days and right. days of work. And when you hear stories like on Netflix right now, they, they, they talk to you about the making of, uh, of, uh, back to the future and they shot for four weeks with an actor and then replaced him with Michael J. Fox. Right. You know, we can't do that. Right, I made my right. whole movie right, right, in right, two right. weeks. <laughs> and Travis, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to chime in because I, right. I know your uh, you right. film from is a, close to you. A so. perspective from a young filmmaker over yeah. here. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, but you know what you want coming in every day, right? So it's just That's a correct. question of bringing that to life. And Yeah, but it's, 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 it's complicated. Here's one little illustration. William, who came from England, and Johanna, who is the his uh, um, protagonist, uh, counter protagonist. She is. Um, she's on a show called Guantanamo. You know. Yeah, I, yeah, I, sure. She, she, they never had met. You know, so like one day before the shoot, they meet, and then you start making a movie. Now that that in itself. If you watch a lot of movies, you can see when that fails horribly. Right, right. <laughs> because you know there's no chemistry there. Right. And, and that requires phone calls in, in these days with Zoom and everything else. But, yep. you know, that's just one illustration, you know, how, yeah. how you can make a horrible mistake by casting the wrong people. You yeah. Know? And we really, we, you know, I mean, like I say, if it hadn't been for experiences of great casting agent, experience great producers, experience good instincts yeah you know and your ability to have a crew of people that know how to make deadlines right that's huge and so and so tell me about that how do you find the crew well that's part of the reason why i made most of the film in los angeles because i already had people that i had loyal uh lo it. a loyal group of people uh, that's part of it but you know a big part of it is uh is all the choices you make, you know? Right. I mean, no movie gets made without challenges. You heard what Tom Cruise did sure. on Mission Impossible sure. where he told everybody to go <laughs> yeah. screw themselves. Yeah. But I can tell you in, in my own life experiences that, uh, you know, w one, one dick can spoil a whole right. shoot, you know? Right. And we had that. <laughs> yeah. We had somebody that... On that, this one? On this one, yeah. Really? Yeah. That you had to replace or just deal with? A little bit of everything. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And fortunately, the producer on my movie handled it. But, uh, you know, you needed like a hole in the head. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And none of that stuff's predictable. Right. I mean, they're making a movie at my studio this week, and it's with a very famous actor, and it's a big, big Paramount movie, and the building next to me uh, was, was trying to, um, you know, get more money from the production company oh. uh, and basically hold them hostage. And really? They weren't even connected to the shoot. You know, you know what I'm saying? Because they felt that the production was, was compromising their ability to run a business. And you hear this all the time. And it's one of the biggest reasons why people hate shooting in L.A. Right. I'm talking about, you know, because right. small companies get killed yeah. if one neighbor decides to turn his lawnmower on right. just to piss you off. You right. Know? Yeah, and a lot of people go to, like, Georgia now, right? And they go to yeah. uh, Louisiana or, like, right. a lot of these places just because for the tax credits or whatever, right? Correct, correct, yeah. But you didn't do that? You didn't no, we went that. to Tennessee, and okay. we shot all the establishing shots that you saw there, and um, and we shot the, the real factory in a place called Shelbyville, and it was wonderful. I mean... And it's a real pencil factory. Oh, it's one of the few left. And then, yeah, it's at the end of the movie, I think it said there's three left. There, you, in the 1950s, there was... Like I forgot the number. 127 right. or something like and that. And now there's three. Yeah. Wow. It's really interesting, and it's heartbreaking. Even when I went to lunch with the owner of the factory, who's a real wonderful guy, the company that... The factory that makes the pencils called the Musgrave 
pencil company and you can google them but they're the real mccoy yeah but it's hard not to go yeah i wonder when this movie comes out which turned out to be two years later because yeah. of the because of the covid right um are they even going to still be in business you know right it's yeah yeah, so COVID is what delayed everything, like Correct. editing and all, all that? No, we finished the movie literally in March of 20. Oh, wow. And right right as everything one was, day, the world was ending. Literally one day before L.A. was closed, closed wow. down. Wow. Yeah. And then when did you pick things back up? We, we got a distributor about the f- five months ago, and, and then we're now, you know, really close. It's coming out September 3rd. Um, on you'll see it on Amazon or uh, iTunes or yeah. all those other ones, but and it's also coming out in theaters in nine states. I don't know which ones yet, but yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, and then obviously the goal is to make money. Well, or no, it, no, it's I actually, mean it's tough it, to make money. I know, right? Yeah, with with films, yeah, films are tough. You know, I I would say to you that my first goal is to share the story yep. you know my second goal is to try to get enough money back so i can make another one you yep. know it, it, the independent movies are getting killed by uh the world we're living in now right uh, there's no longer um well especially forgetting about covid for a second with the, there it's just harder and harder to break even yeah that's why you got to keep the budget as low as you can keep it and when you go, what is the deal structure for movies like this? When you go on like Amazon or something, does Amazon pay per stream or like how does it? How does I, that I have, work? I have no idea. No idea. You really don't. <laughs> well, in all honesty, we get uh, our, you know, I call them a residual, but we get, we get our share after the distributor, and the outcome of it is is Amazon is one of those one Got of it. those streaming right. uh, ones that share revenue. You know, right. do I know the percentage? No, I right. don't. But it's changed. I yeah. mean, at one point in time, when I finished my movie, I'm not going to say how much, but, you know, we felt that we could get 10 times two years ago at Netflix what they're offering now. Right. And they're just not offering what they used to, you know. Why is that? I think it's probably because there's a glut of content out there. Right. And I also think that they're making their own. Right. And they prefer to make their own. Right. Uh it's odd to me, you know. It's like if I were in a room <laughs> with uh, the Netflix people, I'd say, "Why don't you guys have a click on on you know, on Netflix where you can go to independent films and actually share revenue like Amazon does?" And right. they don't have that business model. Huh. They'd rather do videos, which is what they're trying to do now. To uh, I'm talking about games, video games, to yeah. increase revenue. But I think there's a lot of people that would enjoy independent sure. films. Yeah. Yeah, there's some gems out there. I think there are. Now, will you will this get submitted to festivals? And yeah, stuff we like just that? we just won the Houston Film Festival with this movie. We have been in uh, Dubuque. We've been in uh, Dubuque, Iowa, yeah, where, where Field of Dreams is. Believe it or not, wonderful uh, group of people there. We went to a film festival there. We did. We just went to a film festival two weeks ago in. Um, Arizona, what's that place with the big rocks? Um, Sedona? Sedona, yeah. yeah. Beautiful experience. Yeah, film festivals are fun for a couple. (laughs) Right. Then they become tiresome and uh, challenging. And you're speaking like before the film kind of thing? You speak before the film. Q&A and and all that kind of stuff. But I'm getting to the point where I'm done. (laughs) Yeah? No, it's just hard because, number one... um, you know, the people that actually go to the screenings are locals. Right. So, um, you know, nothing's more painful. It's funny. I have a horrible story to tell you where I went to uh, with my last movie to uh, a festival. And, and at the very same time that my movie was premiering, <laughs> they were giving a, a special tribute to a famous star, I think is Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> and so <laughs> there was nobody in my theater. Right. I mean, think about it. Literally. Yeah. So... That's humiliating. Oh, That's humiliating. Yeah. Timing. It's it's just, yeah. That's brutal. That's brutal. The business can be brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, some of the people you've worked with over the, in the past, you sent me a list that was just, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And you sent me some, some stories. I just wanted to, like, can we go through some of these? Sure. Um, so tell me about Heidi Klum. I well, watch, <laughs> we watch America's Got Talent every week. You know, it's funny. Um, 
I was a photographer, uh, you know, very lucky uh, doing a lot of major stuff, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Budweiser, all these things. And so for me to have a celebrity come to the door and invite him into the studio, this now, Heidi Klum, we're talking, this has to be 30 years ago. Right, you know? right. But she came to the door and, I mean, I, I absolutely could not tell who it was. And she's very dressed down. And I said, you know, are you the makeup artist? You know? <laughs> and she looked at me and she goes, no, I'm Heidi. And I'm going, oh, okay, come on. You know, so that's not a great story, but it is a story about, you know, I think most people that are in the spotlight don't want to be in the spotlight um, only when they're perfect. Right, you know? right. Who is your favorite person that you've worked with? I mean, that's probably hard to answer, but. Well, it's interesting you say that because, uh, you know, to me, there's a whole slew of people that I've had nothing but great experiences with. I worked with Hulk Hogan a lot, uh -huh. and I think he's just a wonderful guy. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the celebrities are sports celebrities, um, and I can tell you, you know, with a lot of confidence that, um, that some people, you know, just totally, and I think I told you the story about working. Like, if, if I've been doing this for over f almost 40 years, I can share with you that I worked with somebody from Vegas named Jerry Lewis, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my story about Jerry Lewis is he's a hard ass, you know? Yeah. Tough, yeah. tough, tough mother effer, yeah. you know? Yeah. And ironically, my uncle was his tax attorney. Really? And he had nothing good to say about him, okay? So one day I got a gig to shoot with in Vegas with uh, Jerry Lewis. And, and after we got done with the shoot, I was a still photographer at the time, I said, hey, let's shoot a picture of your little two dogs because he had, if you know anything about Jerry Lewis, he, he, his dogs were more important to him than anybody. Yeah. And he had matching beds for the dogs that matched his, him and his <laughs> wife's bed. So I shot a picture of him with his two dogs. And then one day, like about a month later, uh, he calls me and he says, I just got this picture in the mail that you sent me. This was before FedEx. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he says, I got to tell you, he goes, y y you changed my life. I mean, I'm crying right now. And I said, you're joking with me. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, if I can do anything for you, you know, um, uh, you just call me back and I'll do it. And I thought to myself at the time, my father was dying of asbestos cancer. And I said to him, this was in the night, this was 1990 because that very uh, month, um, we went to war in Iraq, and then my dad passed away. So this w would have been just a couple months before that. And Jerry says, um, I, saw, I said to him, say, Jerry, d this is a crazy, crazy question, but my dad and mom would love to go see a Wayne Newton. Can you, can you pull some strings to get us some VIP seats? It's the type of thing filmmakers or photographers, yeah. not out of the ordinary to ask a question like that. And right. the next thing you know, uh, he, this is no joke, he sent a private jet to Van Nuys Airport. It had oxygen on it, and he picked up my dad in a wheelchair and my mom, and they went to Las Vegas, front center seats, they went into the green room, and it was a life-changing event for them. Wow. Um, and as my dad said prior to him passing away, that this is one of the best experiences of his life, you know? That's really cool. Yeah. And to think, you know, that this guy that I kind of thought was a monster turned right. out to be, uh, you know, as generous yeah. as one could have ever imagined. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, there's different versions of people sometimes, right? It's like, I mean, there's tons of, I've met so many celebs, you know, with my dad that have a reputation of being like a hard ass or a jerk, right. whatever, but right. I, it's not the version I get of them because of my dad, you know? Sure. But sometimes you still do. Like, uh, I don't know if you ever worked with John Goodman. Not a nice guy. No. He's not a nice guy, you know? Well, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, if you read my notes, you know, we had a big shoot. I, I, I won't mention any brands, but with... Um, the guy with the green hair, what's his name? Uh, Rodman, Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman. And at least he had green yeah, hair yeah. the day we were shooting him. <laughs> and at the time, he was uh, seeing Madonna. And I, uh, you know, we were all uh, exhausted. We had flown to Chicago to shoot with him. We were supposed to shoot at 10 in the morning. Here we are, 7 o'clock at night. And no, uh, you know, he didn't show up. And the client is going through, you know, yeah. really upset. And finally, he shows up around 10 o'clock at night. 
and uh, and then he proceeds to spend I'm not exaggerating two to three hours negotiating with me and the client how long he's gonna have to stand in front of my camera we're all exhausted I mean I've never had ever that type of thing and um, you know did the shoot go okay yeah it took 15 minutes but I felt like we were dragged through you know right right horrible experience horrible experience but you know there are so many great stories you know I mean stories that are truthfully um, remarkable I mean one of the best stories that I think I told you was my story about Ray Charles we're, we're shooting a huge campaign for Powerball and uh, uh, Ray is in in I believe he was in either Texas or Arizona and I was in in, in New York uh, not New York, I was in uh, Washington shooting a guy named, um, God darn it, um, i got to look at my notes That's here. okay, go ahead. The famous uh, uh, college uh, announcer, um, boy, oh boy, Mike Ditka. Not oh. Mike, no, my, not Mike Ditka. It's the that's coach. A, that's a coach. Do you know who I'm talking about? I don't know. I'm trying to look through <laughs> your notes, too. Are you going to edit this? I don't know. No, it's okay. Dick Vitale. Yeah, Dick Vitale. There you go. Okay, Boom. so if you know anything about Dick Vitale, which I honestly didn't. A lot of energy. He's just over the top. Yeah. Just he's like a hurricane. Really, really yeah. great. Yeah. And he says, you know, I'm, we're doing, I think we were doing it for Nike. And he says, you know, um, you know, I want to know everybody in this room's size of their shoe. I'm getting you all shoes. And it was just fired up. And then out of the blue, he got hit with a migraine. And the migraine just shut the production down. He, we all went home. I went, my whole crew, everybody, there's no getting out of it. Right. The, the thing that's bizarre about this story is, is um, I ended up taking a flight earlier, two hours earlier. And my flight on 9-11, September, crashed into the Pentagon. I mean, that's just... It's unbelievable, right? Yeah. So if you don't think that's entertaining enough of a story, then follow this. So I get back to the studio. I go through the, you know, the very next day. And in those days, and I say those days, it, you, I, as a filmmaker, I, you never even thought for a second if I fly to New York on Monday, I could shoot another job on Tuesday because I'll catch the red eye, you know. Right. Well, airline has never been the same since. Yep. You can't predict that. You always got to build in, right, right. you know, what if I miss that flight or what if it gets canceled? In this particular case, you know, we were supposed to shoot Ray Charles that next day, which would have been September 12th. And Ray got stuck because there was, you know, all the flights got canceled. Right. And there was no, no one was allowed to fly. And he, like I said, I think he was in Arizona doing a concert. And, um, and this is just the most wild thing, but he got a phone call. He couldn't leave. He has his own airplane, and uh, George Bush calls him <laughs> and says, we'd like you to you know, do a tribute to 9-11 in New Jersey. Can you do it? And, um, and he says, well, yeah, uh, if you can get me to Los Angeles to do my shoot with Silverman. And I thought, ooh, I mean, this is the way he told me the story, <laughs> right. Ray. And I thought, okay, that's cool. So next thing you know, he got a flight out of Arizona and showed up, and we actually did the shoot. And um, we had a full orchestra, a huge set, and he sang, uh, you know, the uh, America the Beautiful. And I, I got to tell you, there wasn't a dry in the... Yeah, I bet. The, oh, my God. And then this is the best part of the story. Then he gets an emergency phone call, and we stop everything. And who's on the phone? The Pope asking him to come to Italy to do a tribute for 9-11 there. I mean, you can't make this stuff no, up. <laughs> that's just wild. What is it like knowing that you could have been on a plane that ended your life? Does that... I haven't... You know, it's interesting. When I tell a story like I just told you, uh, I, I don't think about it. You know? Right. And, and uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's heartbreaking, you know? Because a lot of people lost their lives, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> but but I think that's what life is. Is even if it's not tragic, you know, very few people they make. I've seen some really cool movies about this, where if you would have turned left, yeah, your life would have changed. I've met a different woman. I've yeah. always wanted to do a movie like that. Like I've always thought about so many different 
scenarios in my life, choices that you make. Like, what if I never would have stopped doing stand up? What if I never would have done this? What right. if I would have done that? You know, and what would have happened and, and see how it plays out. And we never know, right? But in your case, you actually know at least on this one specific. I like that. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's wild. Yeah. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And I became good friends with Ray Charles probably because of this experience. And I became his guy, you know? So just like with your father, you, d you do good deeds with celebrities. Next yeah. thing you know, you're the, you're the guy. They can't, no one else can shoot with them. Right. Uh, you know, he's telling them, you got to work with Jay, you know? I mean, that's incredible. That, that was a huge break for me. Yeah. Huge break. Wow. You still keep in touch with well, him? Well, Ray, Ray passed away. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I was named Stevie Wonder for a second. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's two guys that you had on this list that uh, they're notorious for not being nice guys. Um, I've only dealt with one of them, and he was super nice, but I've heard horrible things, and I watched his documentary. I don't know if you watched the, the Jordan, uh, Michael Jordan uh, oh, documentary, well. but yeah. you've, you've got... Uh, <laughs> I have, I have, yeah. My story with Michael Jordan is more about the business because, you know, in order for you to understand the pressures and why people in my position have reputations for being problem solvers, taking a challenge of working with Michael Jordan and turning it into an extravaganza is, is one thing. But doing straight stuff that requires him to be in front of a camera and do things, you know, is um, I became successful because I did it um, with the most difficult people. <laughs> right. And in his case, you know, he was supposed to show up at 1030 because he had to play two rounds of golf before <laughs> he showed up. And then he walks in the door and literally we had three stages. One stage was a locker room. One stage was a... a um, an, an, an elaborate uh, basketball court and another stage was just green screen. But we literally had spent days and days and days working with, you come from advertising. We had, I think, 25 different advertising agencies vying for specific issues with this, with Michael, you know, right. we need him to do this. We need him to do that. And, and it's the first time I'd ever done something that um, um, huge because right. we had two hours with him and I had to accomplish, let's just say, 50 things. And um, I remember shooting a commercial, which I was doing. I, I, I don't want to mention the name of the company, but uh, literally shot one take. <laughs> and then I went over to him and said, Michael, can we do one more with this? And then his agent walked right in front of me, turned off the light, made him turn off the lights, and he, and he just got up and left. And it had nothing to do with me. It had to right. do with the power of being a guy that simply doesn't take any shit, you know? Right. Yeah. So wild. I, I know. It's, it's, and, but, you know, literally, and, and this is the most exciting thing for me, is I remember walking in my parking lot, because I have three stages, and I had Michael Jordan had just finished, and on the other stage, I had the guy that walked on the moon. Uh, Neil Armstrong? Ne no. The, oh, uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin? Buzz Aldrin, and we built this moonscape, and he was... right. He was walking on that set, and of course, all the, you know, the, the uh, I don't know what you call it, but the the deniers that say he never went right, to right. the moon. Uh, that's one of the times where he slugged somebody literally a day before we were shooting him. You know, uh, and and then on the other and on the other stage, we were shooting Ray Charles. You know, and it's like wow, I I, I couldn't be more, um, you know, thrilled. Right. Yeah. Wow. How do you get the clients? Just word of mouth? Just I, over the years? I, it's just I, snowball coming down the hill kind of thing? No, nah, it's, it's, it's the story I just told you. You know, I don't want to sit back and say, because I'm a very, very passionate guy. I do what I love. Uh, but look, uh, taking the, the picture or making the spot is just part of it. 99% of it is all the things that it takes to get the guy to sit in front of you and cooperate. Right. And, and I, I use this story a lot when I talk about my career because I think it's super important to understand that, as you know, they got millions of dollars in media against whatever I do. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's a, a commercial, they could spend $10 million on that commercial. And so what they 
pay me to produce that commercial is peanuts compared to what they're spending. Right. So it really requires uh, their choices to be made based upon no different than gambling. You know, they yep. know that w why would I want to save? I'm making this up five grand uh, if if Silverman can do it, and and he's got a reputation of working with difficult people right <laughs> and he can get it accomplished so I, I that was my reputation for solving problems it's interesting yeah um, are there some celebs that you just couldn't break through with that oh you yeah just couldn't deal yeah, with yeah one of the worst experiences of my career and I'm not ashamed ashamed I don't I don't even remember his name but the guy from Seinfeld you know the uh, the, which one, Kramer? Kramer. Or, no, yeah. Oh, yeah. not Kramer. No, a horrible. <laughs> Michael Richards? Yeah, what a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. This has to be 25 years ago, but, you know, we were, we were, uh, he was in the studio. By the way, and, yeah. side note, Your Travis <laughs> has never seen an episode of Seinfeld. Of Seinfeld. Okay. How no. disgusting is that? You guys are old. I'm wow. Young. Oh my wow. God. Brutal, huh? Yeah. Brutal, well, Jay. The, the, if, if you watch the show. The disrespect to the show business. <laughs> 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 no, but it's curious. If yeah. you watch the show, you think, oh my God, if I had to pick one, I think I'd pick him. For, For sure. sure. Yeah. So in my case, um, he comes in with an attitude and it just gets worse and worse and worse and everybody. In, in this particular case, the client, huge, huge, huge client had five agencies there from New York, from Europe, all vying for this campaign I'm shooting. And the long of the short of it is, is that I, I've never had this happen before, but I would say to him, in one shot, he had the soft drink on his right finger, like a basketball, and the globe on his left finger, and he's supposed to be going, ha, 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 you know, like, 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 you know. Yeah. We're the king. Yep. So I would tell him, just like I do in my daily thing, no different than any other photographer or filmmaker, this is what my goal is. Uh, da, 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 da. Right, right, right. He looked at Here's me, the bit. And he mimicked me and made fun of me. And then, 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 then like that. And I thought, everybody, I looked behind me. There was 50 people behind me, you know, all agency people. And he goes, who the fuck wrote this script? It's horrible. And the poor guy <laughs> from New York said I did, you know? Right. And he just ripped him a new, a new you know what? And, and I got to tell you something, you know? Undeserving. And, yeah. And in my case, I was, if I had just a little bit more life experiences, I probably would have said F you and, uh, and walked out. Right. Um, but I, you it's know, tough though in that spot, oh right? My God. I mean, could you also, it's, there's oh, a lot of money on the line. I still, probably. Have to, I still have to deliver the goods, right? You know, right. And, and I, I only tell the story, and I'm not ashamed to say who it was because it's real. Yeah. And there were a lot of people that were there that witnessed it, but it's just insanity. And then, of course, what he ended up doing in his, right. in his own life after that, yeah, he cut is, his own throat. Yeah. You know? but, but it's the same situation. He, yeah. he had no, he had no governor, you know, he just yeah. did it. Wow. Yeah, I had one of those. Uh, I was so, ex you know, I've met everyone. And for the most part, everyone's pretty nice. Yeah. You know, um, and like I said, I also get a different version of people. But um, when I lived in Branson, Missouri with my dad in the 90s, um, Regis and Kathy Lee came to do their shows there for like a week. So they had everyone that was would normally be on the show instead of going to New York came to Branson, Missouri, you know, for that week. So one of them was Mel Gibson. Who I loved, man. Like I loved Mad Max. And the I of course. just loved Mad Mel Gibson back in yeah. the day, right? I was so excited to meet Mel Gibson. You know, and they taped the show seven o'clock in the morning, whatever it is. So I get over there nice and early because we could get me in, you know, whatever. Right. And my dad was on one of that shows too that week, um, and uh, I don't know if they, he was on the same one with Mel or not. But regardless, I was over there, but I wasn't with my dad. So I, you know, normally I get to meet the celeb with my dad, and it's like a different deal, and like, we get more time with him, whatever. <laughs> but in this case, like I was just going to be able to be at the right place at the right time and just meet Mel Gibson. I'm not even a picture guy, but I just I just wanted to like meet him. I'll say this: to get to Branson, you got to fly to Springfield. You got to drive an hour to Branson. It's irritating. There's traffic, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's early in the morning. So I'll cut him a break on that, but not a nice guy. No, yeah. Not a nice guy. Yeah. I was so disappointed. So disappointed. 
I met like Kevin Costner and like another one that I loved. Nicest guy in the world. Well, I I, I wrote on that list a story about um, that famous bicyclist. Oh, that got into trouble. Yes, with, um, Lance Lance Armstrong. Yeah, and you know, here again, I'm telling the story as it really <laughs> was. But in Lance's case, we were shooting a day before Thanksgiving. We were supposed to get him at 10 in the morning, and he was supposed to show up with his, you know, sports bike, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And uh, I think at 7 at night, he shows up, and of course, all of us missed our flights. None of us got home for Thanksgiving, and uh, and he didn't even bring his bike. He didn't even bring his attire, which was all, you know, sponsored by. Right. Horrible, horrible, horrible experience. And then, then after that, all that shit yeah. broke out. Yeah, you know, with his drugs and all that stuff. Yeah, you know. But you know, up until that moment, everybody was wearing the bands. Right. Remember that? Live strong. Oh, we all had yeah. those yellow fucking bands on. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, it's like bulletproof. Yeah, it has to be the best experience. Can't wait. I'm going to go shoot Lance. Right. Go to Austin. I think Austin. That's where it was. Yeah. 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 Austin. Horrible. Horrible. Horrible experience you know why because all the people that i hired i ruined their thanksgiving right or he ruined their and you think you're doing a great thing i i, I it's gonna be like one I, thing yeah, you'll remember yeah. about your career yeah. like a no, one I of those i don't even highlights yeah and the same thing happened with tiger woods which i'm sure you've heard stories about yeah know. i've heard terrible what happened with him no it's just you know, something that was a big, big deal, and we yeah. show up and we do all the, the flips and backflips, and we finally get to do it, and it's like he's not there. You know, right? He wasn't physically, emotionally there, and it, it does happen. I still got the job done. Yeah. You know, and then in contrast to that, since we're talking about golfers, I worked with you know the famous uh, God Jack Nicholas or no the other Fred one. Couples. I worked with him too. Uh, I'm running out of golfers. Uh, uh, the the one that's the most famous. Come on. Besides Tiger, he, uh, Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer. Damn. So so I get this job for <laughs> for Cadillac. I drink the drink for God's sake. No, you're great. Yeah. But I've got this disorder, so I yes. can't remember. It's anything. okay. It's okay. <laughs> but I, but in this particular case, true story yeah. about um, about Arnold Palmer. So we we get the call. It's for Cadillac. I'm real proud of the project we did. But um, we, this is this is applicable considering Donald Trump. So one thing leads to another, and uh, we go through some great extent to find the location, the golf course, and we right. end up going on the golf course that Donald Trump owned in, I think, somewhere by Laguna Beach. I don't okay remember, in that area, and it hadn't, it didn't have a, a um, an 18th hole. It fell into the ocean. Uh, so it was good. It was a perfect situation because the course wasn't being used at the level. So we were able to get it, but it was a huge, huge undertaking. Because, you know, when you shoot a TV commercial, you got to block off two holes before and two holes after. And right. they got to run their clientele around us. Right. So it was a big deal. <laughs> and, I, and I said to my client, I go, guys, I said, I've been doing this for so many years. Here's my advice. Call Arnold Palmer and say, hey, do you have a course you'd prefer to shoot at, right? Oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. He gets, he arrives in a private jet. He comes out the door, and the first thing he says is, why the fuck are we shooting here? He goes, you could have come for free and shot it in Palm Springs, you know, or wherever he was. Right. I don't remember. But it's like those types of things as a filmmaker yeah. make you crazy because yeah. they were avoidable. Right. Isn't it annoying when the client's, that hire you for your expertise don't listen <laughs> won't listen to it what is that it happens to, to, to me all the time yeah yeah and and it's you know it's indicative of the field because everybody is trying to to uh i can't bother him but right. that's your job right <laughs> Why, you know you gotta have the courage to go up to him and say guess what right you know stuff's gonna go bad now yeah i hate to tell you but we'll prepare you for it no, they don't do it. Is part of the celeb, like, like you know, we've talked about how they could be high maintenance, whatever. Right. Um, do you also kind of give them a break, like, to walk a mile in their shoes? Like, oh, it's got to be brutal, right? No, like, to I, be I, Justin Bieber it's, 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 it sucks, it right? It sucks. No, but I'll tell you something. Um, um, Miller, the comedian... Dennis Miller. Dennis Miller, yeah. yeah. I was shooting a job for him with for Miller Beer, and uh, <laughs> he's got a 
incredibly bad reputation working with people like me. Yeah. And I literally went right to him in the dressing room and go, hey. Really? Dennis. I heard you got the worst reputation. Really? I'm a little stage frightened here. And he looked at me and he put his arm around me. We had the, the best shoot. I don't think anybody did that before. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Had the courage to just call it what it was. Yeah. And he goes, oh, I'm, an, I'm not going to bust your balls today. It's funny. <laughs> My dad did that with Howard Stern. Like, remember back in the day, like, Howard's kind of changed. He's kind of evolved. But, like, younger Howard, like, when he was, like, the E! Right. Channel show was first sure. getting hot, whatever. Um my dad went on there. My dad was like a little nervous, like, fuck, you know, like Howard's going to roast me. Like, this is not going to go well, right. you know, and my dad got there and um, my dad actually t somehow they started talking about Jerry Lewis. Well, they brought up the Jerry huh. Lewis telethon huh. and which my dad used to host in New York and then sometimes here in Vegas with Jerry. But my dad was like the New York guy. You right. know, Jerry was here. My dad was in New York and uh, I don't know who was in L.A., um, maybe Ed McMahon. But um, uh my dad told Howard like a, a Jerry Lewis story, and apparently Howard is a huge Jerry Lewis fan, as just about anyone in showbiz, yeah. especially if you like comedy uh, back in the day, you know, you love Jerry Lewis. Um, and Howard was like, wow, like, like so you, you could pick up the phone and just call Jerry Lewis? My dad was like, yeah, you know. And then Howard was like, you know, could we ever go to dinner, like the three of us? My dad was like, <laughs> of course, like we could go to dinner. And he's like, really? You take me, you know. And then my dad was like, Howard, I'm kind of bummed out right now. He's like, why? He's like, well, I was nervous that you were going to be like mean and, you know, and, and like hard on me. Like, you know, this yeah. is it, you know, and Howard was like, oh, I like you. He's like, w w we can if you want, you know, and he's like, <laughs> well, can you give me a little bit of like what, it, what, it, you know, what Howard, you know, being rough would be like? And he's like, all right, so which one of those two girls did you fuck? Which one? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> but yeah, it's funny how the reputation I'll, can I'll, psych you out. I'll tell you a funny story. George Carlin. Yeah. We were shooting him. What a genius he was. Oh, the best. So I had a studio in Hollywood, and there was probably 10 people there. And I knew that the doorbell was going to ring at 12 with, believe it or not, uh, I forget the, the, who, the family that owned Anheuser-Busch. What were they? Uh, the, the Bush, the Augie Bush. Bush. Yeah. yeah, yeah. but his son was, was running the business at the time. Yep. Very Augie nice. Bush the fourth or yeah. something. Yeah, I've, very, I've met him. Very, yeah. very yep. nice guy. Very nice guy. Yep. And I knew him because we had met two or three times. And I said, the doorbell's going to ring. And the minute the door opens, I said, do me a favor. Because we're sitting there having a tuna sandwich. You right. Know? And, and I said, when he comes in, and you can tell how the dated of the show is right now, because I'm going to tell you that I tell him to say, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so I say, say to him, and the door opens, I go, Mr. Bush, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and, and guess what? He walks in and he, he doesn't say a word and he goes, George, I haven't seen you since the last, you know, they had, they had yeah. known each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? So That's the funny. joke was on me. Right, you know right. I mean? Funny. Last week uh, here in Vegas, we went over to the Laugh Factory Comedy Club. And uh, I know the owner, Harry Basil, uh, he owns the club here in, in Vegas. And uh, he sets us up and it's like an honor to sit in the Rodney Dangerfield booth <laughs> and of course i was with young travis and some of the other folks here from sticky paws studios and uh they have no clue who roddy dangerfield <laughs> is. it's unbelievable it's a, right yeah um you 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 worked with him i did i did Ro Ro he had a reputation for being a hard ass yeah he did i had worked with him multiple times and i got a call and this is a great story. I says, the call came from New York at 6 o'clock at night, and we had to shoot him at 9 in the morning. And it was for AT&T. Big, big job. And um, in those days, I was doing photography only. And in those days, um, you shot film, not digital film. Right, right, right. right. So um, he had the first right of being able to approve uh, the proof sheet before he would let the clients see the images so they negotiated this so we get done with the shoot and of course the whole time you know god bless him you know he had a little cooler like you carry around <laughs> heart valves in you know right and he had his liquor and he had his cocktails and so on and so forth and he was uh, you know doing well for himself yeah when we did the shoot and and it's interesting because if you saw the finished piece that i did he's turning his 
his tie, just like the famous <coughs> yeah. moment. Yeah. And I kept saying to him, you know, Rodney, we got to get that shot. And yeah. this was Rodney, you know, probably in his 70s at yeah. the time. And I'm telling you, and this isn't meant to be disrespectful, but he didn't look like the Rodney I knew. Right. So right. I had to keep telling him, can you just do this? And I got one frame where he did that. Yeah. Okay. So long story short, we get done with the shoot. He goes back to the Beverly Hills Hotel. And we get a phone call from his agent saying, you know, we need to see the proof sheets tonight because they got a really hot deadline. Anyways, one thing leads to another, and I send my producer. And at the time, um, you know, she's a real attractive redhead. And uh, she goes to his door, and he shows up at the door in a, in a you know, a robe, <laughs> totally naked underneath it. And it was not closed, okay? Right. <laughs> and in those days, she could have, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all I can tell you is, is uh, things have changed. Yeah, you things know? have changed. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And incidentally, if I told that story to 10 other people that are in the business, they'd say, oh, yeah. Yeah. He walked out in the chute. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, the right. That's funny. Um, and then uh, I know you worked with you. You worked with Clint Eastwood, legend. You worked well, with legend after legend. Yeah, Clint Eastwood was a. I know. I'm very. I was very lucky. And I. Do the legends know their legends? Oh yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Clint is all business, total business. If you know anything about Clint Eastwood as a filmmaker, you'll know that he is, uh, you know, basically one take guy. You know, the total opposite of, of like a Tarant Scorsese, Tarantino, or, a, yeah, yeah, or yeah, Scorsese. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe you get two takes, you know, um, and, uh, there's a number of wonderful stories on YouTube of him telling his prop master, you know, because the, the car pulls up to the front of the record factory in one of those movies and, and it's supposed to go poop, poop and black smoke come out of the pipe and the prop master, sir, can you please just give me one take, one more take? And, and, and. He calls action, and then he just walks away. You know what I mean? In, in other words, he's already on to the next shot. Right, right. And, of course, it didn't poop the next shot either, you know? But when I worked with Clint, um, which was for a, a movie which most of your viewers won't ever hear, I believe it's called um, Firefox was the name of the movie. I remember Firefox. Yeah. It was a good good, good film. Yeah. And um, we shot the poster, you know, and he stood in front of my camera. I swear to you. This is when you're shooting film, so it's not digital where you can, you can screw up and fix it in post. Okay. Yep. And I literally shot three frames, and he walked away. You know. Really. And he goes, "You got it, kid. I'll never forget that because it had to be at least thirty <laughs> years ago, right?" He goes, "You got it, kid." And I go, "Well, Clint, can I just get one more?" And he goes, "Why? You got it." And and in those days, you know, if you didn't hit the exposure exactly correctly, right you would have a no shoot. You'd have none to show. Right. So I had... And you don't know yet. I don't know yet. Right. And typically what you did in those days is you would cut off two frames of your roll, process that, and if it processed good, then you'd finish processing all your other rolls. Mm -hmm. I only had three frames, period. So we cut off one frame, and it cut off half his face, but we knew what we did, and they ended up using one of the other two. So you did get it. Oh yeah, I got. Of course, I got it. But not without, he knew not without a lot of sweat. Yeah. <laughs> Travis, can you imagine that? That there was a time when you would actually take a picture with a camera and not know what it looks like for days until yeah. you got it uh, developed. Yeah, there was a lot less uh, photographers for that reason. Yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. Of skilled it's, people. It's very true. Very true. When did you know you wanted to, to be a photographer? Like, what, what did you want to be when you were little? When you were a little you, kid? You, you know what's interesting? My brother studied photography as a high school student, and I wanted to be like him, you know? And one day, um, I realized that I could tell a story with a photograph, which is, you know, probably the most exciting because my mentor, my teacher, you know, would bring in all these Life magazine photographers in a, you know, public school to speak to the students in high school. I mean, and I was like in 10th grade, and I'm going, I want to be just like that. And uh, uh, it's funny. They bring in these famous journalists f that uh, would show, you know, this, I'm going to show you a picture now. And they'd say, this is a picture from the most famous Ford Motor court case where the tire malfunctioned and killed two people in a car. And, and there's only one picture that they're going to use for Life magazine, but in this photographer found the right place to shoot it where Ford dropped the tire 
on the the judge's uh, bench and right through it you could see the 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 judge through the whole of the circle and then the 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 remaining family of the um the the people that perished yep. and it was all in one picture and it goes my God, I want to be that. I want to do that. Tell stories, you know, through pictures. That's why it's so painful for me when I hire a photographer to work for me on my movie, and I come back and it's like, Whoa, I got nothing here. <laughs> right. And they go, What do you mean you got nothing? I go, Tell a story, you know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. You know, oh, I see. There's an actor here, and you're there, and the camera's going down a dolly track, and you're in the middle of Kentucky. You know, I want to see all that in right. the picture. So it requires you to be intuitive. Right, right. So that excited me. That's why I wanted to be a photographer. And what was your first, like, big break? <laughs> boy, oh, boy. As a photographer? Yeah. Uh, I know exactly what it was. I, there was a famous celebrity at the time named Art Linkletter. Cool, a comedian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, um, because my... I want to say Art Linkletter hosted The Tonight Show before... No, that's Jack Parr, right? Did Art Linkletter ever know. host the Tonight Show? I don't know. Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, okay. But but uh, that was my first job for L.A. Times. I shot a picture of him, and uh, yeah. And then my second big break was shooting Tony Bennett. Wow. And that was you know now I look back on he's still alive. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone you haven't shot that you'd like, wow, I wish I could shoot I'm this I'm not person. a celebrity junkie. I'm just no. not. As, as crazy as it sounds, right? you know, um, it's funny. Uh, in my movie, in this movie, um, Saving Paradise, is a very famous actor named Paul Dooley. And do you, do you, do you know the name? I do. Which char wait, uh, which character was he? He was the... He was the... Gr he played Gramps. Gramps, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's right, a, right, right. Yeah. yeah. He's very recognizable. He did a movie that I grew up with that, you know, you'll never forget. It's called Breaking Away. Of course, the yeah. cycling yeah. movie, right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, and he's on the set every day. And it's like, you know, right. he, he's, it's such a wonderful thing to be yeah. sitting next to him in a director's chair. And, and he says, you know, if you try this, have you thought of that? I go, I'm going to try it, you yeah. know. Uh, so I get that thrill. Yeah. You know, and when you hear stories, if, especially if you're a filmmaker that, I want to learn all the time, you know, I think it's just incredibly exciting to hear the differential between, you know, someone like Alfred Hitchcock, who literally never talked to the talent and just held a finger up, give me a little more, a little less. Yeah. Same thing with um, uh, Woody Allen. You know, these are people that hired the best actors right. and let them do what they do. Right. And I, you know, I couldn't be more thrilled with that attitude versus you go to the set and the director is trying to tell the actor how to act. Yeah. You know, which is incredibly the, the, painful. Back to Saving uh, Paradise, the casting in that to me was perfect. Thank you. Um, that, that old lady that worked in the factory, oh, the old she, white lady. Yeah, um, she, yeah it's uh, Mary Pat Gleason. And if your viewers watch a show called Mom, she was a regular on that show. She was great. I mean, like she, she just was passed a, away. Oh no, yeah, really? It's heartbreaking. I, I'm going to tell you something. She was. Did she get to see the movie? She did. Okay. I showed it to her in her hospital bed. You know. Wow. Yeah. She, she she was great. I mean, she was a real factory worker, like yeah. in them, like to me, like she's like yeah. all of them, all the the big black guy, all of them, all of those worker employees at that factory felt real. Well, real to a, a me. lot of them were real, by the way. Really? <laughs> well, whenever I shot factory workers working in the pencil factory, those were real employees. Okay. And believe it or not, for your filmmakers out there that listen. All that footage was shot with my iPhone. <laughs> Stop! I'm not joking. And the reason why is because I only had three hours in the factory. And all the making of how they make a pencil was done with my iPhone 10 at the time. With a special lens on it or just no, as is? Just as is. Wow! But it was 4K, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and I'm sharing this with your viewers because I know that, um, you know, filmmakers are making movies with iPhones now like it's a no big deal. But... There's just no way you could have done what I did with that iPhone in four hours without it with a real piece of equipment. Right, right. <laughs> you just you wouldn't be able to move it from A to B to C. Right. As many shots as I got, hundreds right. of shots. You know, and that's exciting because yeah. you can't even tell. 
no way. I would yeah. never. I would never even think that you would attempt it, or that you know, just because when you think of like film, it's just everything's grand. Well, it's in your funny. Head. It's funny you say that because the DP and the camera operator were brought. We brought a camera there, and we started doing shots. And he was going so slow. I said, "There's no way I'm going to show the finish of how a pencil's made." So I started simultaneously going around and shooting each piece, and we ended up using eighty <laughs> percent of it was from my phone. Wow! Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. The last, I don't know, twenty or thirty minutes of that movie, the it, it had so many layers to it of resolving right. things, you know, sure. from, from the movie. I don't want to give it away, but like, it was really great. I mean, it really was. Like, it just kept. It was like layer upon layer upon layer, you know. As as someone was watching, it was it was really great. Like all of those characters came full circle. Um, it was it was really congrats. It Thank was just you. it was fun fun movie. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, Van, who wrote the movie, and we bought the film, uh, the screen. We got the screenplay. Did something very unusual. He actually came to L.A. He's from uh, Philadelphia. He came to L.A. and worked with my crew, which was a, a guy named Joe. Um, and Bethany together, they're producers and writers, uh, and together we worked um, on making the script even better. Really? With his permission. And I think all directors would have done that anyways. But yeah. The fact that the original writer was willing to do that amped it up. We made it, I think, you know, a very exciting film. And, yeah. And a doable one, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, typically when a writer writes an independent movie, he doesn't think about costs. Right. And, you know, what you have to do is you got to go, you know, I know you wanted, I, the, my last movie takes place uh, uh, the way the writer originally wrote it with a, um, a balloon uh, chase, you know, those big giant balloons. Right. And I go, there's no way. We could, uh, the cost of the movie would be 50% more to just do the finale. Right. So we ended up shooting in on the Rio Grande uh, in um, in New Mexico, and you know that still was a, a feat, but at five percent of the cost, mm -hmm. you know, because people were put in in a challenging situation in the in in the in the waves of the right. of the of the Rio Grande, you know. When you watch the movie, when you watch the movie, is there are you happy with it, or like are you a perfectionist to the point where you're like, uh, it didn't like it's yeah, good, I, but I wish it had X, Y, and Z. I think. You know, I'm very proud of it, and I I also think that there isn't any filmmakers that would step back and go, I you know I wish I hadn't done something else. You right. Know, you know what I mean? Um, but I'm very proud of it. You know, I mean, the movie that I'm doing next is called Yale, and it's and we've spent now this entire pandemic uh, polishing it, and literally we're just getting ready to give it to uh, some actors. Um, that's the optimum situation where you can literally spend two years tuning it in, asking the questions that you don't typically have time to ask. Right. And in this particular case, it's a brilliant, uh, true story. And, um, you know, I'm super excited about making it because um, I'm feeling it. I'm living it. So is the goal for you one a year? No, it's one every three years. One every three years. Yeah, two and a half years. Okay. In this particular case, we wrapped and finish this movie entirely in, in March of 20. And I'll probably, if the pandemic kind of stops, mm -hmm. I won't shoot a movie during a pandemic because I can't afford it. Right. It's just too expensive. Yeah. But I think maybe the first quarter or second quarter of 2022 yeah. um, will make Yale. I'm friends with Randall Emmett. Um, he produced Lone Survivor. Uh, the Irishman with, with Scorsese and De Niro and a bunch of other movies. And he just directed his first movie called Midnight in the Switchgrass. Uh, huh. It's out now. It's with uh, Megan Fox and uh, Lucas Haas. Remember Lucas Haas yeah. from, from Witness yeah. when he was a little kid? <laughs> yeah, uh, Lucas wow. Haas and uh, Machine Gun Kelly has a small part in there. Wow. And uh, they ended up, you know, they started in March of 2020 and then pandemic happened so they shot the movie in 17 days over the course of a year right. how brutal and it's his first time directing can you imagine how brutal in puerto rico how brutal <laughs> brutal right that's impossible <laughs> I, I mean like my, how do you even 
like well, pick up where you left off if yeah. you're like eight months later, right? Like the energy wise, the it's 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 tough, right? Well, you know, you asked earlier, you know, um, what are the challenges? You know, a challenge that I didn't even mention is in this next movie that I'm doing, you know, we're going to have a big, big star playing Yale, which is somebody that's over 70. And and I'm telling you that something that's an underlining concern of mine when we book this guy is you can't screw around. You have to shoot at that exact time. Yeah. Because he'll have bookings on both sides. Right. And it's a, it's I think it's an Oscar role, you know. It's really? A, oh, big time, big time. Wow. And uh, but it's an independent movie. It'll be made in less than twenty five days. Right. And you know, but even when I shot my first movie with Peter Coyote, we knew we had him for one week. Yeah. And we put him in a hotel, and it was a dream working with this guy. But um, you know, we didn't deviate. Yeah. You follow my point? Sure. And uh, in Hollywood, it's, you know, it's just filled that's, with deadlines and pressures. Gotta that's the other it, thing you know. I think a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of times you have, like, let's say the lead in the film, right. you have them for two or three days. Some, like, I know that's Bruce right. Willis has done a lot <laughs> yeah. of movies that, like, uh, he did a movie called Marauders that, again, Randall pr produced Marauders. Right. They had Bruce Willis for one day. He's the star of the film. How do you do that? Well, that's... What you're describing is something that is, at least it was a trend a couple of years ago where they'd pay millions of dollars for the name yep. and they would figure out a way to get them in and out in a couple of days. And it's all about foreign sales, right? It's, all, it's right. all about. That's right. Yeah. So I don't have the luxury of doing that. But right. I'm just saying. Um, I Tough know, to do, I though, right? Well, like that's to... basically my commercial career. Right. You got a guy, you know, they're paying him $10 million to be in front of my camera for two hours. Right. And then he's gone. And it is what it is. And he's not happy to be there. Right. <laughs> Even though he's getting the money. <laughs> that just blows me away. I right. Mean, that's what made me, you know, kind of jaded about the celebrity aspect. Right. Because, of course, that's all I did. And by the way, you know, these people are pros. Yeah. The one, most of them are pros. They'll come. They'll be there on time. Yeah. They'll deliver the goods. And then they'll walk out. And they'll, you know, like right. I said, millions of dollars. And they're getting paid whether you... Yeah, for that whether whether or not you can get right. the shots right because well I have never not gotten that. right resourceful is yeah the word yeah uh, I saw you worked with one of my favorites The Rock well you know it's funny I worked with with The Rock I don't even know what his name was because it was right. The Rock at the right. time and uh, we did WWW you know yeah. and we were shooting him um, you know with the cast at the time and he was just. One of the guys. Yeah. And he was so gentle and whatever you want, you know. Yeah. And I, my understanding is that's his reputation. Yeah. You know. And so it's possible, you know. Yeah. But he's, he, he, he's, you can see by him promoting currently that uh, Disney ride, whatever it is. Right. That he's still highly Which invested. was kind of funny. I saw it. Yeah. yeah. Well, did you enjoy it? I did. I thought I was going to hate it. I had low expectation. I, mean, I love, love The Rock, but those movies like uh, this, yeah yeah they're for know. kids yeah it's for family but there's a lot of comedy in there that's he's he's really good he's with really comedy. good at yeah. I, his timing yeah. yeah but i mean he's, i looked at him when we worked with him i go this guy's really got the goods yeah you know he's strong he's muscular and he's got a great personality yeah. and you know all this stuff and i predicted i said this guy's going places you yeah know? do you do you when you're casting um or when you're just even before you're casting, when you just look at a script and you're considering who who to cast, do you think about trying to do like what Quentin Tarantino did with John Travolta? Like, do you oh, try, so, do you do you think every about day. how can I revive <laughs> uh, a career, or, or 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 do you do you think like that? I sure do. Is a and is Tony Orlando one of the names that pops in your head? <laughs> <laughs> it's so no, it's so it's so interesting that you just said that because I swear to you. Um, um, if the movie that I'm getting ready to make, uh, you know, cat out of the bag, we'd love to get somebody like a, um, the Fonz. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Great example. Henry Winkler. Yeah. Would, and, uh, and if you, if you follow him on his two shows on, on Netflix, uh, one being the one with, um, Michael Douglas and the other one being the one that's called the, uh, Barry. Yep. He's brilliant. Yeah. 
and he is the character yeah. that I want to make. So, I mean, I want to, and, and I'm currently using some creativity to try to get Tim, because traditionally what you got to do, just for the record, you wake up in the morning, you, your casting agent gives you a list, yeah. and the casting agent says you want to make an offer to you know, uh, Henry, it's, you know, the, the lowest offer you can do is X, Y, Z. And I'm going, this is my life. I just spent three years on this. I'd like to just let them read the script and then talk to him. You know, right. it has nothing to do with money. It has to do with, because I don't want him to go, I would never do that. You see what I mean? Right. And I'm telling you, this role is such a precious, wonderful, magnificent story about a, a, a grandfather who uh, doesn't know his, his uh, grandson and he ends up you know doing some just extraordinary things to uh to save his life and uh and that's just a fragment of the story but the reason i'm sharing it with you is is this travolta story that you just described yeah. comes to my mind and as a matter of fact the last time i worked with the hulk and you know the hulk's hair isn't his you yeah know? yeah he's like me <laughs> yeah yeah and I'm looking at him and I'm going, you know, I'd love to give him a role in one of my movies where he is, he's a, a breakaway, you know? Yeah. And by the way, they did that with, I believe, The Wrestler or one of those movies with... Mi with Mickey Rourke. Yeah, Mickey Rourke. Yep. I mean, for unrecognizable sure. for yeah. reasons that we all know. Yeah. Andrew Dice Clay, too, in oh, Star is Born was, was great. I, I, hopefully he, yeah. he gets more from that, you know? I worked with Andrew quite a few times and... and he lives uh, here now. He, oh, he does? Yeah. Unbelievable in that uh, uh, movie. What was it? Um, the Woody Allen movie uh, where he plays a uh, Brooklyn. Um, oh, God, I forgot about that yeah, movie. Yeah, he was brilliant yeah, in that yeah, movie. Yeah. Oh, he was, I forgot all he about was, that movie. He was good in the one you just Stars mentioned. Stars Born, yeah. Stars Born. Yeah. And, and the guy's got the yeah, goods. He's good. The guy's, yeah. So here's a wonderful example, and this is not meant to be anything but negative. Uh, and I don't, wouldn't say anything negative about him, but yeah. I could see myself getting all excited. We'll call up Andrew and see if he wants this role. And the truth of it is, you know, you, you, bing. You, <laughs> I'm not saying that would be the case with right. him, but it's like, what? Right. You know, I think when John Travolta got casted by Tarantino, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I'm not privileged to the real story, but you know, uh, I'm sure he was the last choice from anybody that's outside of the window, you know? Yeah, well, he was Quentin's first choice, um, but he, yeah. he just told the story on Rogan, actually, oh, on Dur really? like two weeks ago. <laughs> um, and so they, they asked him for a list of who would you want to play Vincent, right? Uh -huh. And so he gave them a long list, and he threw Travolta on that list, knowing that was his first choice, yeah. but he knew if he led with Travolta, right. the studio would shoot it down. Right. And, um, and so he... Uh, the way he tells it, he gave this long list, and he feels like they they okayed the list, and he, there was such a long list. He feels like the name was just like overlooked <laughs> by the studio, and but they signed off on it, and wow. I guess contractually, like they said, okay, we'll we'll give you the money or whatever it is, right. you know, we'll agree, you know, any of these names are good for this character, any right. of these names are good for this character, and so on and so forth, and so he he thinks it was like. He just squeaked it through, <laughs> you know, and then boom, no, I, Travolta. I, I hadn't heard that story. Yeah, but, but it, it's set in stone now. Everybody wants to do that, you right? Know? I, I mean, is it nice to make a film and not have to deal with this? Like, obviously, there's benefits to a studio film because you right. know, you, you know, you've got more built-in distribution. Yeah, but see, I had the opposite. And, I had the opposite happen to me because I spent my whole career working with A-list talent, right? That wasn't being paid for by me it was being paid right. for by the client um and millions and millions of dollars sure and then i start making movies and you know my movies are in like you know we've discussed yeah under a million dollars some of them right and my last one was well under two million so this most recent one yeah yeah that's still cheap it's unbelievable i know i know but you know what? You go to a distributor when you make a deal and you go, you know, do you think we can make back my investment? And they look at you and they go, if you made it for 500 grand, that's what they tell you now. Right. And, and, and they're being serious. Right. Because they don't they want you to lower your expectations. And there's just the, no the way. The bulk of the money goes to talent? No, the bulk of the money in my <clears throat> movies, you know, is spread. Okay. Because I think it's, I come from an aesthetic. Right. You know, I, I want my movie to look like, a, a big movie. Right. I mean, you, did you think it, it looked look, great? Yeah, yeah, it looks great. There's and, a lot and, of shots that look 
amazingly like factory yeah. shots and yeah. yeah but i mean that does not happen without uh you know even even though we got the factory for free you yeah know? i love the music yeah. too the whole score throughout uh, throughout was perfect the 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 gentleman who who made the uh, the score has made the score to all my movies david holden and i'm going to tell you something um all the music is recorded in i believe um eastern europe with real live musicians you know wow. that's like impossible these days yeah. budapest is where he scored my movie so that's pretty cool. Yeah. And but you know, scoring a film is is to me as important as a script. How I'm hands on are you with that? I was part. involved in all of it. Yeah. I'm not. I didn't write the music. Right. Right. But, but you're I, overseeing. I, you're you're I'm, picking, I'm, agreeing with choices and things like that. Absolutely. Scene to scene. Yeah. Also, some of the quirky stuff that exists in in this movie that you just saw is motivated by me because I wanted to mix it up. You know. Right. Um, and by the way, you know, we can't afford to buy a Rolling Stones song, you know. We can't right. afford to, uh, even though that's what, if you turn on all the stuff that's popping up on Netflix right now, the big stuff, yeah, they, they've bought every song from our past. Right. And it just gives the movie credibility, you right. know, even though the movie might not be as great as you think. Yeah. But my God, they certainly spent a ton of money on music. Yeah, you could you could buy music. I bet you their music budget was ten times the cost of my movie. Right. Yeah, I believe. I'm it. not exaggerating. Yeah, and incidentally, in five years, because I'm noticing this on Amazon and Netflix, they're, the, all that music's being pulled away because they can't afford to pay the right. the licensing on it. So they're they're going with needle drop and stuff. Right. And big movies. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Are you, uh, what are some of the shows like you like to, do you binge out on, on I, watching I, shows and stuff or? I, yeah, I go through the same stuff you do. Ozark? <laughs> like, are you, are you ready oh, yeah, for I season watched. four of Ozark? I think Ozark's brilliant. You know? So good. Yeah. I've worked with Jason and, and his career is just skyrocketed yeah. in the last. Is he a nice years. guy? He seems Very, like a nice guy. He's exactly like I've you. seen him at Dodger games, but I never talked to him. I never go up to anybody, but I always see him at Dodger yeah, games. I listened to his podcast. Have you ever listened no. to his podcast? It's, uh, it's called Speechless or something like that. But yeah. He's with two other gentlemen that are both stars. Yeah. I forget the names of them, but, um, and they just talk, you know, they yeah. bring on the big stars or the big, whoever it might be. And, uh, it's a really he he is you know exactly what you think he'd be yeah he has got a big heart yeah and he used my studio to make edu bad education or something oh that was good yeah the spelling bee movie or something right that's right yeah yeah, yeah that was good yeah he's so good you know I I love the breakup uh, you know <laughs> Vince Vaughn and yeah. he's in it and John Favreau yeah I was watching that with uh, with Vanessa and um because I'm always like he's so good in Ozark. He's so good. And uh, we'll watch Breakup, and I'm like, look at him. Do you realize that's Marty Bird? That's Marty Bird. I know. Like, really acknowledge <laughs> how no, good he is. It's interesting, though, because obviously that's my generation, and I look at him, and I, we used to make fun of him. He was a joke. He was a joke. He was on failed sitcom after failed sitcom that's to right. the point where, like, how does this guy keep getting – and not right. not his fault maybe necessarily, right? But he was – I can't even name any of the uh, – like, like, literally, there was, like, three or four sitcoms all with Jason Bateman that never really right. went anywhere. Right. And they were decent shows, but they just right. – for whatever reason, they never really worked. No, it's just it's, – it's interesting because he reinvented himself. Yeah. And uh, – I mean that Ozark is just one example. Oh. I, I mean, you know, there's just there's just so much great. T when you have the capacity as a as a person that's been in Hollywood as long as he has, yeah, to really understand the process, yeah, and not only be in the movie, you know, but participate in writing it, right? He he Direct. shot he shot the pilot of yep. that show. You know, the guy's the, the guy's a legend. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, same thing with uh, the comedian that did that um, the movie. This is where you're going to look at me and uh, think I'm crazy. But that film that um, was on, I believe it was on HBO about the prison, um, directed by a comedian. Um, uh, the guy from Night in the Museum. What's his name? Oh, Ben Stiller. Yeah, Ben Stiller directed it. I forget the name of it, but it's won a bunch of awards. Yeah. It's a dark, gringy kind of like. You know something you'd never expect right. from him, 
and he's a genius. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he, but you know, these people have lived their entire adult lives in front of a camera or right. behind the and camera. And they grew, especially in Ben Stiller's case, yeah. like you said, he grew up, you know, his parents were legends, you know, his mom <laughs> was on my dad's TV show all the time. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's so funny. His father, I used to have a studio on Fairfax in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. And his father would go to the deli across the street every time I went there. And I'd look at him and he goes, Hey, you got anything for me? You know, because he, he didn't know what I did, but he knew I had a studio across yeah. the street. And I'm thinking, if he was alive today, he would be the guy that I'm looking for. You right, know? right. And, and of course, everybody's thinking the only way to get through to him through his agent. You see yeah. what I mean? Yeah. True story. Yeah. Is it tough dealing with agents sometimes because they, they, they block things? I've always been very cooperative with all this stuff. You know, yeah. the, the key to it is, is... You've built the relationships, right? No, but I think it's all about building relationships. And, you know, your ability to be able to make people feel comfortable right. is as important as your ability to do what you do. Yeah. And uh, the last thing I want to do is walk on eggshells. Yeah. And I, and, and I mean that as a filmmaker. You sure. Know, it's... I, I mean, as an example, you could tell me, I can get you X, Y, Z for this movie, and I'm going, uh, I don't think so. And yeah. incidentally, there's a guy that I would love to play Yale right now, but he's on that list of, uh, you know, people that stepped on the wrong side. Right. You right. know what I'm referring to. Sure, 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 you sure. Know? So yeah. everybody around me is going, you can't hire him. Right. He, he, he fondled somebody 30, 40 years ago. Right. Think about that. It's weird that, but but some guys they give a pass to. Well, it's so weird, right? I, like, yeah, I mean, it's I, like we, I, we we listen. I worked with Morgan Freeman multiple times, the nicest guy you'd ever meet. Yeah, and if you told me he did something wrong, I'd say impossible. I right, was, uh, there's no way. Right. So I have an opinion about that, but right. apparently he did do something. You right. Know? But he's still getting work. You know. <laughs> right. So right. he's he's an ex he, he's one of the lucky ones. You know. Yeah. I mean, I feel horrible about it. I, I, I can tell you a story about myself where I was shooting two famous stars, major television show, and I went into the dressing room and I was telling them what I'm about to do and I do what I always do. I put my hand on her shoulder and I started to massage her shoulder. And this is, like I said, 30 years ago. You know, right. I, I forget the name of the TV series. And literally an hour later, I got a phone call from Paramount and they said, we need to talk to you about something. And she made a complaint that I was, and this was way before all this stuff's going sure, on. Sure, yeah. So I, had, I, and I've never been more frightened in my life by right. both lawyers. Yeah. I was profusely apologizing. And I was in a, there was 10 people in the room with right. me. Right, it's just a. Yeah. It was nothing yeah. sexual. No, I get it. <laughs> but yeah. it doesn't matter what I think. Right. You know, so I, I get it. And, you know, things are a lot different now. You know, yeah. you, you cannot. I, I find it super fascinating to watch a movie on any of these shows, on the streaming, and, and see the amount of sexual uh, content that's available with big stars and just what that might have been like to negotiate. Right. Yeah. I mean, it had to have been just <clears throat> incredible. Every time we watch TV now or a movie, we, we always go like, oh, you can make that today. Couldn't do that today. He's Seinfeld. I don't know if you could make Seinfeld today <laughs> with some of the episodes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, because they go into that zone. Yeah, You're right. You're right. Uh, it's it's a weird place right now. Yeah, it's a weird place. And and I'm I've got three daughters, so you know I'm I'm reminded constantly to right. be aware of the fact that would I want that to happen to my daughter? Any of them aspiring to be TV, film, photography? One of them wanted to be a photographer. Another one, uh, my oldest one, is is actually a very uh, successful uh, chef. Really, and she actually works for one of the most famous comics in the in the business. Like as right a now. private chef. As a private chef. Really? Yeah. As a matter of fact, Kevin Hart. No. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I'm not allowed to reveal. No, that, I understand. I understand. As, Sebastian. As a no. <laughs> okay. No. 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 I'm not, I'm not going down a list of. I was just. I was just throwing out a name. No, but I was, That's all. Eddie Murphy. Eddie. Hey, um, hey. All right. No, but what I was going to say is, she also uh, has done my my last movie, which is called Off the Menu, and it's about foodies mm. going through Taos, New Mexico, and. Okay. Uh, she did all the food and she did a magnificent job, you know? So yeah. it feels good, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, dude, this was a lot of fun. I love that you flew in for this. Did we, did we cover any, did we miss anything that you, that you 
<laughs> you didn't embarrass me too much. No, you, know? you can always come back too. You know, this Thank isn't you. a one Thank one and you. done. No, I'm very fl- I'm very flattered uh, to be on your show. And like I told you outside, I worked with your dad as an assistant to the to the photographer um, way back at the beginning. This had to be you know 38 years ago. Yeah, or something probably like early that. 70s maybe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I was 16. I know that for a fact. Wow. But I was, in those days, I knew what I wanted, and I literally worked for this famous photographer, and he was working with your dad, and and uh, I, I remember that like yesterday. That's it's so funny wild. how time flies. That was in L.A.? It was in L.A., yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's shooting his album cover, you know? That's so crazy. That's so crazy. And it, st- it sticks with you, you know? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's like I go flying into Vegas here. You know, nine out of ten times I've come here on business, you know, and you, you don't know what's going on in these big buildings, but there's a lot of stuff being shot yeah. in Vegas. Yeah. Especially with big stars. You yeah. Know? It's funny. I met uh, Quentin Tarantino at a nightclub in L.A., like a bar, not even a nightclub. Do you remember the restaurant, um, was it called Lola's? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember Lola's like yeah. on La Brea maybe or right. Fairfax or one of those streets, right? It was like mm-hmm. they had good pizza. It was like a, you know, it was like a spot. It was dinner right. and then but right. like a bar or whatever. Yeah, I met, I ran into him there. And he was like by himself eating, you know, and normally I don't ever, I would never bother anybody, you know, but I just couldn't, it was Quentin Tarantino. I was like right. pretty close, not too long after Pulp Fiction, you know, right. and I was like, hey, I was a big fan, blah, blah, blah. You know, my dad's Tony Orlando. He was like, Tony Orlando? He's like, I love your dad. He's like, and he's like, your dad did a sketch on his variety show with Freddie Prinz. And he was like, tell me this about this sketch that he loved. It was just so weird to me. Like, wow. Like, you just, I would never think, I'm think. I always assume, like, oh, he's not even know who my dad is, you know? And uh, he not only knew, like, he had a, a specific story about a sketch oh, yeah. from the show. You know, it's, it's very interesting. I shot a TV show with, with Tarantino. Yeah. Uh, the movie that he made uh, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, what was that movie called? Uh, you know, it was about that took place during the slavery. Oh, right. Um, Django. Django. Yeah. Django. Just Django. Just Django, yeah, not Django. Django. Not Django. Just Django. Yep. Yeah, Jamie Foxx is in that too, right? Right. Yeah. Right. But I, but I, we, we did a uh, special with him, and uh-huh. uh, same deal, you know, he comes right up and... I never felt like uh, he was going to cut me short because I always go down that road. And he goes, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get blown off in a second. here. Right. I don't want to ever put myself in that position. So I, right. I tread lightly um, in and out. <laughs> no, but there was this very famous uh, uh, baseball player um, and uh, w- w- African-American, uh, one of the original um, Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron. Okay. I'm See how I do that? A thousand day. Yeah. I think you could work it's for good. me. We would. We should go on pyramid. You give the clues. Yeah. And I'll give the answers. But we make twenty five grand on you pyramid. You saw my hand yeah. moving like this. Yeah. But so so here I am shooting this, and it was for Carnation. Yeah. Was about, this has Carnation. to be thirty five years ago. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So follow this. So my uncle at the time, who you know was a very quiet, you know, he worked for. Uh, the Department of Water Power, okay? Yeah. He says, you're shooting with Hank Aaron. Jay, I want you to know something, you know, that, 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 okay? So he would never come to my studio, you know, even though he was very proud of me, but yeah. he would never make his way there. And we were very close. You know, when you grow up as a kid and you got uncles and aunts and all that, he was, you know, one of my favorites. Yeah. Long story short, he shows up to the sheet, doesn't say a word, sits there very passively. And I, he gets this opportunity where I said, you know, uh, Hank, I'd like to introduce you to my uncle, and uh, and my uncle, like like s- somebody gave him some kind of a drug, and he goes, ah, the fifth game, second inning, da 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 da. He knew exactly. Yeah. He says, well, how did it feel? It was like his biggest game, right? You know, and uh, uh, you know, we all have th- that moment, you yeah, know, where you really feel like uh, you know you're set free, you yeah. Know? And Hank just embraced him, you know. And it also happened, which is a great story with Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen had just made Apocalypse Now. He had just come out of a heart attack. I'm shooting him for a billboard, and uh, um, his agent had prefaced it. This happens all the time. No one asked for an autograph. No one's allowed to talk to him, da-da-da-da-da. 
So I tell my mom, who used to come all the time to the studio, and I say, Mom, uh, we're shooting Martin Sheen. Oh, my God, I love Martin Sheen. She makes him a cheesecake, okay? True story. Shows up to the studio, and, of course, I'm thinking, Mom, stop her at the door, you know? <laughs> you cannot come in. You know, I don't want you to bring the cheesecake in. And, and he sees her with the cheesecake, and he goes, who's that? And I go, this is my mother. I'm so sorry. I'm, you know, I know the rules. And he goes, are you kidding me? He brings it in. They talk for an hour. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, and he was the most, and he He's turned a out, nice guy. he turned out to be the kind of guy that would call me once or twice a year. Yeah. He calls my dad a couple times a year. He is the sweetest Just to guy. Say hi. I have his home phone number. Yeah. That's how sweet He's a good guy. guy is. Yeah. Yeah. He'll get arrested. He's no stranger to getting arrested for a cause, but <laughs> well, it's funny. You know, I was his, I was his call dialer for political ads. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. He'd come in. I'm not joking to you. And he would say, <laughs> I got 15 today. And it would just be a close up of him saying, you know, judge so-and-so yeah. and Cincinnati uh, is a brilliant man. <laughs> wow. And he would do commercials for them all free. Yeah. You know? Well, Cool. I mean, and, th and that's the kind of stuff that, you know, you, you don't read about, you know, right. and it's funny because I was shooting him and I had done a, a public service announcement for the junior blind. And I've got a certain interest in that because obviously my eyes are, do make me allowed to do what I do. And I said, would you, would you be, would you even consider doing a, a voiceover for me on this? And he goes, I'll do it on camera. <laughs> And I go, well, what about, you know, SAG? We can't afford all that. He goes, just run it, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was for nonprofit, right. you know? That's and it was, it's one of my favorite things I've ever done with him. He is, he, is, he is the epitome of the super pro. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about an individual that has the capacity to do one take, he did love letters in front of me for, I believe, uh, Ronald Reagan and his wife. And he read both sides of their love letters. Never stopped for one hour, made never, no mistakes. Wow. And it was like a podcast in those yeah. days, you know? Yeah. You got stories for days, Jay Silverman. I love it. I love it. Go see my movie. <laughs> yes, definitely. So when does it open again? When, it's what? September 3rd. Um, it'll be in some theaters across the country. But yep. mostly it's going to be on um, platforms like uh, Amazon, uh, iTunes. Yeah. Spectrum and you know, there's a whole bunch of them. We'd yeah. be on like 20 of them. Good luck with it, man. It was, Thank it's you really so much. good. Congratulations on it. I Thank look forward you. to the next one. Let's make this a thing. You come on every time you have a movie. All right. I made my day. All right. I like I it. I really appreciate it. And I'm f really proud of you. Thanks, man. Thank you. It's a big deal. Thank you. And especially because you don't have a baseball cap anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got the, the your viewers biggest know? hair transplants. Oh, yeah. I talk about it all the time. Yeah, you yeah. do. Yeah. I didn't even know it. Yeah. So it's only four it worked. months. It almost worked. five months. Yeah. And, and just in case I get it done. Yeah. This is what I look we like. We can do it. Vegas hair transplants <laughs> can fix you. Dr. Corsani. Okay, Dr. Corsani. <laughs> All right, ma'am. We'll Thank see you, you next so week. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.